I'm here at the grave of Gorchester in the Anglican Cemetery in Cotkinabalu, North Sabah. Now Chester was one of the now largely forgotten actors who was endeavouring to prevent the terrible atrocities committed by the Japanese against the Sandak and POWs. His epitaph says, a pioneer victory in Borneo 1943 to 45 and a lovely man. So what part did he actually play? I'll give a brief thumbnail sketch for his life. He was born in 1898 in South Africa, but was brought up in England and indeed served with the British Army in the First World War, fighting in northern France. Between the wars, he spent 20 years out here as a rubber planter, and on the outbreak of World War II, he rejoined the British Army, although was soon reassigned to serve in the Australian Army in the secret services there because of his natural assets. He was fluent in Malay and obviously knew Borneo extremely well. And indeed, in that capacity, he led three clandestine operations over here. I'm sitting on Sunundu Hill, which is a prominent local landmark overlooking Kotkinabalu or Jesselton, as he was known back then. And it also has good views over the South China Sea. Well, to resume our story, it's the second of the three Gort Chester expeditions which is of interest to us. This was called AGAS-1 and its purpose was to gather intelligence about the conditions at the Sandakan POW camp because a rescue mission was already being planned back in Australia. This was due to arrive in October 1944 when all of these surviving POWs would still have been in the camp. But owing to a series of delays, incompetencies, lack of determination by the SRD, the expedition didn't actually arrive until early March 1945. And by this time, the first group of nearly 500 POWs had left on the death march to Renau. But not only was the expedition delayed, it was landed in the wrong place. Chester very much wanted to be on the south side of the Sandakan Peninsula, as close to the camp as possible, so he could gather his own intelligence. This was overruled by the decision makers at SRD, and they were landed on the north side in Labuk Bay. Now I'm standing on the edge of Labuk Bay. I don't know if this is close to where the AWAS-1 mission was put down or not and I doubt if the official records in Canberra would confirm it one way or the other because these were heavily redacted by the SRD at the end of the Second World War. But for the moment let's assume that this is somewhere close to the location. Now my sat nav shows it's over 40 kilometres from here to the 8 mile POW camp and this would have been a formidable obstacle. In order to get there they need to travel by night, of course, to avoid the Japanese patrols. They'd need a local guide. They'd need to take roundabout small jungle trails. I very much doubt if they would have made more than, say, 10 kilometers per night. So it would probably have taken them a good four nights to uh, get to their target. And because this wasn't practicable, they had to rely on uh, intelligence reports provided second-hand by friendly locals based in the Santa Can area. The information which was given back to them was that all of the POWs had been evacuated and that the camp was now empty. Now I guess that the locals had seen a column of POWs trudging past back in January, but they hadn't done a head count and they'd assume that this was the whole contingent. And furthermore, no one managed to get close enough to the camp to see if there were still any POWs inside. By my arithmetic, I reckon there would still have been about 1,800 at this time. The information that the camp was now empty was sent back to SRD in Australia in early April 1945 and this information had absolutely devastating consequences. Now when the faulty intelligence was received from AGAS-1 
uh, to the effect that all of the uh, Allied POWs had been evacuated from Sandakan by the Japanese. The plan to liberate them was immediately cancelled. Now the Allied commanders knew of the extreme importance of liberating POWs and internees because the Japanese camp commanders had standing instructions to murder the internees rather than let them be liberated by Allied forces. And this had indeed already happened on the Philippine island of Palawan where 140 US uh, POWs had been burnt alive by the Japanese in advance of the arrival of Allied forces. General MacArthur authorised three operations to liberate POWs and these were all brilliantly successful and resulted in the liberation of around 8,000 POWs and internees. And these took place at uh, Cabanwatan in central Luzon in Manila where two POW camps were liberated and at Los Banos to the south of Manila. Now the last one is of particular interest here because the US forces effectively used exactly the same plan that the, that the Australians had in mind for Sandakan. And this was a coup de main operation conducted by 200 paratroops ably supported by Filipino guerrillas. And they struck um, at dawn. Indeed the Filipino guerrillas jumped the gun by about 10 minutes they caught the Japanese completely by surprise and by the time the paratroops arrived the fighting was effectively already over. The camp was freed and the uh, internees were taken down to the local lake uh, Laguna de Bay and they were ferried by amphibious vehicle across the lake to the other side where the US forces were already in control. And this was a brilliantly successful operation with the loss of only a handful of guerrillas and troops. The unfortunate um, footnote to this is that when the Japanese retook the camp after the internees had gone, they took reprisals on the local population, some 1,500 innocent Filipinos were butchered by the Japanese in an atrocious war crime. Now the Australian planning was at an advanced stage um, and this was called uh, Operation Kingfisher. Some 700 paratroops had been training in Queensland for some months. 70 aircraft had been made available for the drop and indeed this was more than double the required number and ships had been made available for the evacuation and these steamed into the Sandakan area in advance of the main Australian landings in Borneo. But when the uh, faulty intelligence was received from AGAS-1, the Australian Commander-in-Chief, uh, General Sir Thomas Blamey, immediately cancelled the operation and indeed sent the paratroops off on three weeks leave. And I'm afraid to say that at that point, the poor, wretched POWs were abandoned by their government and by the Australian High Command. And what was their fate? In short, they all perished. All of the POWs who remained in Japanese hands uh, perished, nearly uh, 2,400, and only six survived, and those were the fortunate ones who managed to escape Japanese clutches. But worse than this, after the cancellation of Operation Kingfisher, it was assumed that there was a free hand for bombing of Sandakan area, which is what took place, including of the POW camp. And there were still some 800 POWs there. And I'm afraid to say that a number of POWs were killed by Allied bombs. I cannot think of anything more heartbreaking for a wretched POW who survived nearly four years of absolute misery, torture and hell at the Japanese hands, only to perish at the hands of his comrades. So what was the aftermath? Well, I'm afraid to say that after the war, the Australian government, for various motives, conducted a cover-up operation and they completely swept under the carpet anything to do with the events at Sandakan.
Very little information was given out to the grieving relatives of the deceased POWs, which merely added to their anguish. And furthermore, there was a conspiracy of silence with the Australian press to report nothing about the war crimes trials being conducted against the Japanese uh, who were responsible for the Sandakan atrocities. The whole thing was shameful. And what about the aptly named General Sir Thomas Blamey and the Services Reconnaissance Department? They've got a lot to answer for. Blamey was both head of the Australian Armed Forces but also had direct responsibility for the SRD. Now the SRD had plenty of time to plan the operation, um, Operation Kingfisher. And over the next eight months, a lot of planning and preparation was performed but ultimately the operation didn't go ahead and this was purely down to the incompetence and lack of energy, initiative and drive shown by the SRD. And it's not as if this type of operation could not succeed as the US forces had shown on three separate occasions. Furthermore, after the war the SRD wanted to cover its tracks and conducted a wide-ranging exercise to edit the, their war files and all references to Operation Kingfisher were deleted. Now General Blamey never accepted any personal responsibility for this. After the war he was speaking to a symposium of retired uh, Australian um, ex-servicemen and he did refer to Operation Kingfisher and he said it had his full support but he blamed General Douglas MacArthur, the commander of the theatre, for not supporting him and not making the necessary aircraft available. We're talking about 30 transport aircraft, no more. Now the surrounding evidence and indeed MacArthur's own actions in the Philippines would uh, point to the contrary. I think the whole thing is a blot on Blamey's war career. And as for Gort Chester, well after AGAS-1 he went on to lead the much more successful AGAS-3 operation and they were charged with mounting guerrilla operations in western Borneo in advance of the landings by the main Australian liberating forces. And this seems to have been conspicuously successful and it's reported that a large part of British North Borneo was under the control of the guerrillas by the time that the Australian forces landed. He himself survived the war and he left the services and indeed uh, he resigned his commission with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. All he wanted to do was to return to civilian life and indeed become a rubber planter again as he had been between the two wars. He went back to Jesselton in early 1946 but unfortunately his dream did not come true and within eight months he was, he was dead from the dreaded Blackwater fever. He's buried in the city as I've already shown and I have to say he was a brave, dedicated and committed officer and it would appear that he was also a most lovable man.